Ni, dere omikus sõbrad. Good morning, friends. Täna omikul ma teen asja inglis keeles, nii et see on viimane asi, mis ma eesti keeles ütlen. Mul on siin sõber Gordon, kus minuga Hollandist. Nii et nüüd ma lähen inglis keele peale üle. Good morning, friends. Again, I am doing this today in English, hopefully. Most everybody can follow, even English. I can't speak in touch, unfortunately. I can speak in tongues and maybe Gordon has an interpretation, but um, I'm here with um, uh, Brother Gordon Van Balen from Holland. He's the ambassador of the Healing Rooms Ministry. Been in Estonia many, many times, just came years ago, first over church, and we really felt the divine connection and his ministry touched so many of our people. And um, we have just finished a nice breakfast. I did. Um, I made Gordon to eat my oatmeal, my special oatmeal. He's still alive. Yeah. No symptoms yet. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> and we tried the berries. Yeah, the the, the cloudberry jam, yeah. which I picked myself the berries. But anyway, we wanted to discuss some things this morning and share and see where this would go. But um, we live in a very interesting times nowadays. <clears throat> the world has changed in the last few years, coronavirus and all the things happening around the world. So what is your overall sense, Gordon? Where is the world today? Is, is that what you call pre-end time <laughs> <laughs> events? Like now we're going to really step over to the okay. last, last phase? Or okay. what, what do you feel? What's going on in your opinion? Well, um, I think that the people of this generation have never experienced a war. They, uh, they never experienced hunger. They never experienced an epidemia before. That's right. So they're quite shocked about uh, the COVID thing. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's, it's nothing. I mean, just think of the generation before us that experienced the Second World War. Yeah. I mean, for them, surely, that, that was the idea, like the end of time has come. Exactly. <clears throat> so many people died, and not only of the, the military violence, but also of hunger and um, <clears throat> fire and, and, and bombardments and whatever happened. So disaster and death was quite near to them, much more than now. And then I think about the same period, you know, you had those epidemias of tuberculosis mm -hmm. and <clears throat> so many families were torn apart. The mothers being in a in a sanatorium. I remember my great grandfather who died of tuberculosis at 28, and so every he was married for eight years. Every year his wife would write something in the in the Bible, and I have that Bible with her personal notes there. Like this year was worse than the year before, wow. and <clears throat> and so he died at 28 of tuberculosis, which was quite a common thing in those days. And then you know after the Second World War we had this epidemia of polio. It paralyzes for children. Yeah. Uh, and so it caused many people that got handicapped and they're now all around 80. But I, I have some friends that, that still uh, walk in, in, in metal frames because they got uh, polio. And that was quite a big number of people that got affected. Mm. And at that point, there was no vaccination that came later. So, um, <clears throat> so we are the spoiled generation. That, yeah, blue bonnie. Plague, bubonic plague. <coughs> bubonic plague that was in the sixteen hundred maybe or something. Yes, it happened three times. Uh, that started killed like uh, one third of Europe or something. Yeah, and that happened three times. Yeah. So the first time was twelve hundred something, when France and England were in a war and they had to stop fighting <laughs> because too many soldiers died. Oh my goodness. And and it happened three times even in the time of Luther there was a bubonic plague. Each time killing about a third of the of the population, so that's quite a different dimension. So what we have is just a minor issue, and people are complaining like crazy that they have like uh, to wear a face mask, mm -hmm. and that they are forced to vaccinations, and and um, so in fact it's just a small thing, but it's taken so big because we ha we haven't experienced this, we haven't experienced this, and um, as most people now have left God, so we have no answer for death. For most people, death means the end of all of it. For a believer, we have a completely different perspective at death. Yeah. You know, we go, to, we go first of all to heaven and then we are waiting for the new heaven and new earth that Christ will bring. Mm -hmm. 
So for us, death is not that threatening yeah. as it is for some people. So we are hugely exaggerating it. Um, yeah. But let's talk about the coronavirus itself now. Yeah. Of course, when it first started out of China, mm-hmm. Wang or whatever the mm-hmm. name of the city was, Wuhan. Wuhan, yeah, then came um, announcements that uh, you know this could be out of the laboratory, yeah. man-made, and um, so. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, personal? Have you done any studies of it? What do you think? Of course, we know that the same name of Jesus is over the disease, either man made it or nature created it. It's all from the devil anyway. You know? Yeah, sure. Well, um, if it was meant to be a war virus, I mean, I, I hope you understand that a term, yeah, war, bi- biological warfare. warfare. Yeah. So actually inducing a sickness to paralyze a country. Um, this, this is a big failure. I mean, the number of people that actually died is too small, you know, to be a war biological virus. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't have that power. I mean, most people survive and especially young people survive. It's only old people and people with underlying conditions that die. So then it's a highly unaffected virus if if it was produced in a laboratory for biological weapons. But whatever, we'll never find out because, and of course China, if it were true, will never, never uh, confess that. Mm-hmm. So that's that's something we simply cannot answer. But you know, uh, sicknesses have been there always. New sicknesses have uh, originated. I'm thinking about Ebola, where that was a new thing. Thinking about HIV, that was a new yeah. thing. So, <clears throat> so it's in this category of sicknesses that didn't, that were not existing many years ago and, and do exist now. So I couldn't comment on this at all. Um, I do not envy the governments in, in in this period because if you as a government are too lenient on it, too easy, like in Brazil, where so many people now die because the president did, simply mm-hmm. didn't take it serious, mm-hmm. or Tanzania, where they said, we don't have that, and then the president himself dies of corona, wow. and, and, <clears throat> and people are completely unprotected, unprotected, and unprepared, so then suddenly the death uh, toll rises. So if but, you don't do enough, you'll be accused of being a murderer. Yeah, but there are now groups of people that say there's no corona at all. It's all fake. It's oh, all... Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> uh, I had it. I had it. Okay. I, uh, I, I, I went to a meeting in Amsterdam and I contracted it there. So suddenly, four days later, hmm. I, I remember Monday evening, I felt so strong. And I thought, okay, I'm going to take my skiers tomorrow. I'm going to, to do that skating. Mm-hmm. And the next morning, I woke up like... And so I had a fever, not not too high, but I felt like so powerless. And so for two days I had high fever. I did make a test. I was tested positive. Then it looked like a flu, so normal coughing, running nose. But then the effects later, that was something that is completely unknown to me. For six weeks I, I needed to sleep 10 to 12 hours a night. While normally low seven and eight will do, mm-hmm. I felt so tired. I tried to do my my morning walk of ten kilometers, and I just had to stop after four, because the energy was not there. All my joints were painful. I didn't feel like eat, eating, and I had moments of disorientation. I couldn't focus, so I realized something attacked my nervous system, and and, and that was something different than you ever had. I never before. had that. I yeah. never had something. Like it wasn't like a regular flu. Like oh, no, no, or because, cold or... because that doesn't attack your nervous system and it doesn't attack your, your memory. Mm-hmm. So moments of short-term memory, memory yeah, were prob- affected. Was affected. And so that took at least six weeks. And, and now and then I still feel like something in my joints that doesn't, uh, that doesn't belong there. But um, so surely COVID is there. It exists, can be very harmful. Uh, one of my friends, a pastor who was overweight, actually died from it. Another friend, a worship leader in Holland, overweight. He survived, but he spent like five days in coma in an intensive five care days. unit. Why? My yeah, days. Yeah. So five days he was kept in coma, and then now he is back home. But it, the whole country was praying for him. Mm. So especially people with the underlying condition were affected. Yeah, we had a guy 
uh, who's a businessman. He's up in 60s and mm -hmm. had a really hard case uh, uh, with the COVID. Uh, was like 47 mm -hmm. oxygen level when he was taken into the hospital. Normally it's usually 90, 92, <clears throat> 95, whatever. And, and he was in coma. He was unaware for a long period of time what's going on. By a miracle, he signed. He's, mm. he's similar to what you named because it, it was just sent out by the prayer request mm. all over the world. I mean, all over Estonia, they prayed for him. So that was serious. That was close by. We all knew him. And uh, quite a few people in our church contracted Corona. Some uh, went through it much, much easier, like children. Mm. And um, But some, you know, dealt with it for weeks and weeks. And uh, so... No doubt, there's a serious thing about it. Um, but, uh, of course, um, <clears throat> some people uh, think, and uh, what you, what your thoughts on this? Could this be like a prelude to the um, mark of the beast <clears throat> and, you know, preparation of the world mindset, like we can lead you as a flock wherever we want make you to do things and sort of like um, you know come to this place where you can only enter with this what we call corona passport and yeah. because everybody <clears throat> one needs one nowadays let's say of course we still will discuss about that vaccine and all of that but then why don't you put it on the skin so I don't need to <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and we do know that the Mark of the Beast will come. Bible declares that. That's no way around mm. it. Will that now be that? Because I've, I thought, you know, people cannot buy and sell if they don't have this mark. Mm -hmm. But nobody really cares today if I have the credit card in my hand yeah, yeah. or I have it under the skin. But let's say if this is an health issue, that something can be discovered early on and you can be maybe saved from stage four cancer because they discovered stage one already with this thing measuring everything under your in your blood system that could be maybe accepted by the world easier so in that fashion i understand that could be like a you know preparation of the mindset but what are your thoughts on it well I, i'm a bit older <laughs> and so i remember that for the first time those credit card kind of things came uh as the normal way of payment, and that payment changed from cash payment, even for your rent, for your electricity, and it changed in um, in electronic payments. Oh yeah, and and so some Christians at that point were yeah, very yeah. upset about it, Ooh. and and antichrist. Uh, yeah, antichrist. antichrist, antichrist, because now it means that the banks are controlling uh, the, the, the the transfer of money, and it's not anymore in your pocket, and you pay cash, and it's now all electronic. So some Christians really got nervous. Uh, in that same time, so I'm talking about the early 80s and late 70s, there was a, a very strong movement in my country called Maranatha movement, mm. uh, expecting the, come, the return of Jesus any moment. Yeah, yeah. And, and so they were <laughs> looking at the signs of the time, uh, what, whatever happened in, in Middle East, whatever happened in our government, this, this um, way of electronic payment, seeing that the signs of the time that the end has come and it will be very near. And I remember in my youth, we were told to memorize the Bible because uh -huh. the, the Soviets were going to come and take uh -huh. away all the Bibles. Bible, so you would remember <clears throat> it. And you had to memorize it. So this idea of imminent catastrophe and the coming of the Antichrist was very strong. And if you lived in that environment for, for 20, 30 years, at some point you get a bit bored. You know, I remember the year 2000 came and we were all still expecting now it's going to happen because now the earth has existed like uh, uh, 6,000 years. So now comes the millennium. Yes. yes. We were all thinking like that. And, and right now I'm a bit disinterested. I mean, <laughs> I am just uh, Focused focusing on, on God, on, on loving him, meeting him, hearing his voice, doing what he tells me to do. And... Well, you know, so this idea like uh, Jesus is coming any moment now is not so vivid for me at this moment. It, um, <clears throat> it's obvious that the devil use any technical um, mm -hmm. uh, thing for his purpose. 
I mean, in the Second World War, um, the Nazis introduced a personal passport, and it could have a G in it, meaning you're a Jew. And so everyone had to have that passport. And, and, and people on the countryside in Holland before that didn't have a passport. I mean, they didn't have it. They did have no identification. Mm. And so suddenly they had to receive this identification card with your picture on it, your fingerprint on it, so that they could be identified. And so surely they saw that as a, as a sign of the beast. And, and, and as uh, the technology develops and things become more electronic and our streets are guarded with cameras, we realize that we are more in the control. People know where we are. If you actually live in China, mm -hmm. the computer will know that you left your house at 8.30, yeah. that you went to buy cigarettes on the shop on the other side, that you went back, that you greeted someone, and they will know who that person is, and that you came back to your house. And, and so they'll find out anything that you do outside your house, and maybe even inside your house. So your life is completely under control, and it's all stored in some kind of computer. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that, that, that brings fear. Like, like, who is behind this? Who controls you? Is, is there somewhere a man that, that looks at you, checking your life? Um, and it's obvious that the devil will use these systems just as Hitler used this, this idea of personal ident identification card. And the more sophisticated it is, the more control an evil person could have on the people. It, it's, it's true. But... Um, yeah, so some people think it's now imminent, it will happen now. I don't think so. I don't think so. Not yet. Up to now, I see revival in Africa. I see in mm. Africa Christianity on the rise. You know, on every street corner in Uganda is a Pentecostal church. Wow. And Christianity is growing at the expense of paganism. Also, Islam is growing, but Christianity is uh, growing faster in East Africa. So there we see uh, positive developments. Um, surely in Western Europe or the whole of Europe uh, we see the Christianity on the decline and we see Antichrist thinking um, um, is on the rise in my own country 52% uh, of the nation is complete atheist and we as believers are regarded as backward, dangerous, homophobe uh, anti-women um, and so we are considered dangerous, stupid, backward and we should be pushed out of society. I see those things happening. Um, so what do you think, Gordon? Would, would revival also hit Europe before the end time comes? What, what well, do you think is a biblical... Well, people, people have asked that before. Um, I, you know, uh, as the situation is now, people in Europe are not needy. They still have good health care, they have everything they need. They're not hungry. They're not hungry, mm. so they're not dependent in any way. So if you talk with people on the street, they simply don't care. They simply don't care. And they They're not interested. Not interested, and they see their lives mm. as decent, you know, they live together, fornicate and whatever. And, and they have no sense of morals, so the idea like, we are sinners, we need salvation, is, is simply not there. Mm. People are not thinking about salvation, they're not thinking about sin, nobody has the need to be saved. And so right now I do not see a readiness to receive, uh, to receive the gospel, that, that's what I see. And so the people that are uh, speaking about revival, I'm saying yes, but Europe is not prepared, it's not pre prepared. Of course when Covid came I thought, is this, you know, helping out, helping out and, and bringing the people in despair so that they will open up for the gospel. But it wasn't bad enough. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes. Sorry not enough shaking. Not, not enough, enough shaking. shaking. Yeah. Yes, that's, so that's what I feel. So we so need more shaking. You could say you need more shaking. Of course, you know, in history, there have been those sovereign acts of God that we call revival, like the Welsh Revival, the, right. the, the Great Awakening in the United States. Lakeland, you know, Lakeland. in one city. <laughs> and then Brownsville in one Brownsville, particular city. Yeah, yeah. So in Holland, we once had a revival in 1730-something at the same time as, as the Wesleys. And so the whole city was completely upset and people would be touched on the fields where they were working, suddenly realizing I'm a sinner and they would run to church and find other people there in the same condition. So such a godly intervention, mm -hmm. uh, of course we're praying for the, those kind of interventions, 
that God will touch a nation and, and, and just change the mind of people and make them feel needy, we need salvation. Those things can happen. But like looking at the population, I would say right now Europe is not yet ready for this, not yet ready to, to repent. Mm. So unless something very dramatic happens, yeah. like a war or something, uh, people are not ready to repent. Yeah, and yeah. maybe you think I'm a very much uh, pessimistic, um, but of course we we try to reach out, and and wherever I come, also when I'm in an airplane or at the airport or in a train or wherever I meet new people, I bring the conversation about Jesus, and um, if there's an opportunity and the conversation is a bit more serious, I'm always asking God, can we have something supernatural here? Mm. So, so sometimes I, 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 I prophesy in trains and in airplanes and then very often those people actually turn to Jesus and, wow. and, and, and come to Jesus at that spot. Wow. You know, so, Bishop Mart, Bahi, our bishop, <clears throat> uh, said that, um, you know, is there a COVID or not? That would not change a thing in what he's called to do. I'm no. still building what God told me to do, mm -hmm. you know, and um, he said, I don't even care if Jesus would come today. I, it wouldn't change anything. It wouldn't like I would now go and do special remorse and repenting and whatever, or I would now just run out and try to just grab my real activity. <clears throat> he said, I would just continue on, on my mission, focus on what the Lord told me to do last. And I think that's what the Lord wants us to yeah, do, find with. I have that same attitude. I have that same attitude. Yeah. And of course, you're hoping for such a godly intervention that people will be, be, be shocked in some way. And that can be done by natural things like a war or a severe sickness. And it can also be done by an emotional thing that God just simply touches the hearts of people. Yeah, and they start to... And they start to repent. Repent and uh, be and that, that There's something more to this, you know. Um, we I, most I definitely think, are waiting for that in Estonia. Sure, we sure. want that to. We had a revival here in 1980s, 90s. I saw that myself, how we went to the main street and presented the gospel, and like 30 people came up next day to the church of all over, mm -hmm. you know, maybe 50 people at the time, and mm -hmm. it just doubled overnight almost. Oh, yeah. And those were such a sweet times. And of course, we do see right now the disinterest and uh, yeah. just being very numb and uh, just, um, you know, secure in the life as it is, the life, this life, secure yeah. in this life. Yeah, I would, I, would, I would still make a comment on this because otherwise we get in a negative mood, you know, like nothing is going to change and we just have to suffer and try and it will have little effect. Well, I actually, I once was in, in a situation comparable to what you said. Uh, some years ago, uh, me and my friend visited a country called Guiana, and it's uh, north of Brazil, and used to be an English colony. And the local Pentecostal bishop sent us to an outpost, a pioneer church, a church that existed for one week, and that had 16 members. And so they came together in a house, 16 people, and me and my friend were sent there to preach. And so I, uh, I started my message, and after uh, five minutes, just God stopped inspiring. And I am that kind of person that I, I speak upon re a revelation, of, upon inspiration, and I do not make a sermon on paper, and I do not have so much a premeditated message. I'm very much trying to move with the Spirit. And so I was quite surprised. I said, Lord, that's quick. You, know, <laughs> you spoke five minutes. And, and so what's up now? Is, does it need miracle time? Yeah. And he said, yes, of course. So I said, okay, Lord, where should we start? And he says, well, start with the knees. That's very often with me, God. Even yesterday evening, yeah, people yeah. got healed of their knees. By the way, this one lady, um, this, this uh, young lady, she said, Tell Brother Gordon that my mom got healed of the knees and she got touched by God and she's not a Christian and she's excited about God now. Okay, great. great. The, late, late at night she sent the message. Okay, wonderful. About last night. Okay, so, so in this group of 16 are five people that, that have a knee problem and so we minister to them. They all get pain-free and, and healed. Wow. And, and I said, okay, Lord, what next? And he says, well, do the back, the back pains. And yeah. There are also five that have a back pain. And so we minister to them. 
And then suddenly the situation turned very chaotic because the people ran away from this meeting place, this is house room. They, they just ran away and they thought, where are they going? What are they doing? Suddenly the whole building is empty. The 60 people are gone. And they came back with their neighbors, people that came in very confused. They didn't know why they came in, but they just heard, God healed my knee. Do you remember I had so much pain for 10 years? Come, come, I just got healed, come. You also have a back problem. And so they started bringing in their neighbors and they all got healed. And a woman came in crying and she says, my husband is paralyzed and it's just 100 meters from here. Can you come? So we went there, 10 minutes later, he could walk. And, and that night, the church grew from 16 people till 85 in mm. one night. Wow. And, and, and so these things do magnetize people, yeah, draw their okay. attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they so, see the anointing. And so I uh, later evaluating this, you know, no Facebook, no advertisement, yeah. uh, you know, just a simple meeting. And we just moved with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit moved. People got healed. And without promotion, exactly. you know, it just happened. And overnight, this church is more than quadruple, quadrupled. I, I, I thought about Brother Gordon uh, some time ago. It's, yeah, when I mentioned about people not hungry enough, and that's the condition, we understand, that's, that's what it is. But when I thought about what would attract the attention of Estonian people today, because as you walk down the street and talk and they're not in, 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 interested, but then God spoke to my heart. He said, the anointing is this, this attractive force. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And when Moses saw the <clears throat> burning bush, that attracted his mm -hmm. attention. And during those days, when I first went to the church, I was a 17 years old man. There were no miracles happening in that service. There was just worship. Okay, there were singing in tongues. But I felt and sensed the anointing in that place. I said, man, what they have is so interesting. I want to know about it. So um, so I, I believe God's going to pour out his anointing in the middle or in front of our enemies. And things can be maybe in the world as they are. And that can attract the attention of Europeans. And even in the middle of the securities and everything they have. Yeah, so um, what we as believers should do we should learn to move in the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. This is, this is so essential. Be a disciple. Yeah, you know, be a disciple. And, and, you know, church as it was, I, I'm not going to put blame on the church because we didn't know any better. But uh, church as it was, was mainly passive. And even today in our evangelical churches, that's a large number of people that is just consumer. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they are waiting for God to bless them. It's about them instead of seeing themselves as disciples, as soldiers in the army of God. And I remember when I uh, became a young believer in 1972, the, the, the message was, you are saved to save others. Mm. So you just gave your life to Jesus. Next week, you're standing in the park, evangelizing with other people, you know, that, that was like normal. So bringing people to Jesus or trying to bring people to Jesus was a, a normal thing. Mm -hmm. So something like I am... Uh, incognito Christian. I'm Christian and uh, and not manifesting this. This is stupid. <laughs> we, we, we are called to save people. We are called to re reach out. Then we are also called to, to move in the Holy Spirit, to move in the power of God. The more we do that, the more we attract people. Mm -hmm. I remember a situation in Africa where we actually did a training for healing rooms. And so by the end of the day, we miracles were happening you know we were healing the sick and at that moment the, the high school next door uh, went out and so all those students passed our building and in fact that building wasn't even a building it was just a few walls so so the, the pupils were looking inside like what's happening there and so suddenly in front of me are three young men 18 years old and and uh, I, they were not in the training at all they must have been watching from the outside and i asked what can i do for you and they said we want to give our lives to Jesus. And I didn't preach about that. I was just teaching, you know, on, on, on healing. And, and even they hadn't heard that, but they saw the presence of God moving in the church and they thought, this is what we want. And they gave their life to Jesus that easily. Mm. So when the presence of God is there, because we are moving in the spirit. Wow. I, I, I would say this, um, we can wait for God to show up. Yes. 
or we can make him show up. <laughs> you know, uh, that's I love so much the gift of prophecy because in prophecy, God, the presence of God, comes in the situation of man. Yeah. And um, and so I'm not even waiting for a spontaneous revelation to come. I'm taking that revelation. Yeah. I know there's plenty of revelation in the Holy Spirit. So whenever there's an occasion, I I will ask people if I can prophesy over them. Yeah, God's more willing to give than you are willing to uh, impart that to others because you, you never tune in. Maybe that's the real, real reason. Once you tune in, God's going to give you something to yeah. say about somebody. Yeah, so um, just when I was a, a younger Christian and I started to discover the gift of prophecy, I thought, how can I, how can I use that? So whenever we were invited to a birthday party, you know, you sit to, next to someone that you don't know, you would have a little conversation. Of course, the conversation is at some point about Jesus. And then I would ask, can I, uh, can I pray for you? Mostly they said yes. But instead of praying, I would prophesy. Mm. And then suddenly you have a person in tears. Others are looking and they ask, can you prophesy for me too? Can you prophesy for me too? And the whole party turned in, into so, something different mm -hmm. with the presence of God. I, uh, I even once did that in a political demonstration. Mm -hmm. So there was a political demonstration in Rome. I will spare you the details. And, um, and somebody recognized me and says, uh, Pastor Gordon, you're here. I said, yes. Can you prophesy for me? Wow. Okay, so I prophesy, you know, in this political demonstration in Rome, I prophesy for this one person. And other people are looking. And so one of them, and another comes like, do you have a word for me as well? Yeah. And so, so at some point I had prophesied over 10 people. And then there's this, this, this young lady and she says, uh, maybe you can prophesy for me. I said, okay. And the moment I touched her hand, I knew, I just knew she had a back pain. I said, do you have a back pain? And she said, yes. I said, okay, put your hands on your belly. And so I put one hand on her belly, one hand on her back. Mm -hmm. Just put a little bit of pressure there, send the power of the Holy Spirit. And she got healed on the street in the middle of a political demonstration. Amen. So I'm thinking we should be more aware that God can use us any place. And, and maybe when I'm saying this, you, you, you feel a lot of fear coming up. Oh, I would never do that. I will never do that. Well, yesterday in the meeting, I, uh, I've been speaking about that, that following Jesus and moving in the Holy Spirit is just one big battle with our personal fears. True. It's, it's, it's one of the major problems that we have. We love the comfort zone. We love, I'm sorry to say that, but some of us think that the Holy Spirit came to give us a good feeling during worship. <laughs> And of yeah. course he does that. He does that. But, that, that, but that's just 1% of what he wants. And that's not the original reason why and he that's, came. That's not the reason why he came. <laughs> yeah, he came for us to make, be able to be witnesses. Yes, yeah. yes. So uh, sure, you know, he agrees with worship, so we have a good feeling. And that's quite okay. And, and so some people say the, the worship was very anointed, which it, it is. I'm, I'm not going against this because that would be very wrong.